<clears throat> All right, good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you for joining us in the latest in the Dean's Conversation Series. And uh, today I'm particularly excited to have as our uh, guest, as our conversation speaker, uh, Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice. Uh, she's got a long and distinguished career, which I will not get into uh, because it would take up much of the hour, uh, but she's the president and dean of the Morehouse School of Medicine. Uh, a native of Georgia, went to Georgia Tech, Harvard Medical School, did OBGYN training uh, at Emory, and has really been one of the leading specialists on a variety of issues, including infertility and uh, women's health issues, particularly for underserved women. And as I said, she is currently the Dean and uh, President of Morehouse School of Medicine. And um, among her many accomplishments has been a, a, being a really important voice for issues of health equity and health care equity and uh, quality of care for underserved populations. And uh, so we're particularly excited to have Dr. Montgomery Rice. And so thank you so much uh, for being here this morning for our conversation series. Just, uh, and before I uh, get us started, I want to remind the audience that if you have questions for Dr. Montgomery Rice, please uh, send them in uh, via chat. You can send them via Twitter. You can uh, put them in the Q&A and we will get to them as quickly as possible. So uh, before I um, ask Dr. Montgomery Rice to say a few words, let me just start off and frame where I think the conversation uh, should begin and then we can go wherever the conversation goes. Uh, but we are you know, 10, 11 months into the worst pandemic of a century. Uh, nearly 300,000 Americans have died. And one of the features of this pandemic, one of the most, uh, sort of egregious, awful features of this pandemic is that it has not affected everyone equally. Uh, it's had very disproportionate impacts on certain populations, on certain communities more than others. And that is not a coincidence. It's not random that that has happened. Uh, in fact, one could argue, one should argue that it was predictable. And the, among the communities that have been the hardest hit in this pandemic uh, has been the African-American community really across the country not in, located to any one region, but the impact really on, on, on Black Americans and Latino Americans, on, on Native Americans. Uh, and these are not small differences, oh, 10% more, 20% more. These are large differences uh, that are stunning. And while we have short-term issues to deal with in terms of uh, working on equity, we have, it exposes long-term issues that we gotta get going on now and, and well into uh, 2021 and beyond. So that's where I want to start our conversation. Uh, and again, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, if you uh, just would get us started by helping all of us think about why, why has this uh, played out this way? Why have there been such disparate impacts in some communities over others? How should we think about it? Um, and then we can get into thinking about what we need to do. But again, thank you so much for joining us this morning. So first of all, thank you for having me and thank you for being the calming voice that you have been on our TV screen on most nights. Uh, the country definitely needs that. They need the honesty, they need the authenticity. And so we appreciate the work that you have been doing to answer questions uh, very consistently and to answer them directly and to answer the question. That, that's been uh, very uh, wonderful to see. So this pandemic, um, while it may have surprised us at the enormity of the impact, what it has unveiled for us should not be a surprise. We know that many of us sort of should have seen this coming. The disparities in this country are longstanding. We, have, we know that uh, Disparities is not a new foreign concept. It is the conditions and the circumstances in which people work, where they play, where they live, where they grow matters. We know that the social determinants of health are, exist. And we know that when the differences, uh, when you start to look at those differences, we see differences in outcomes and health outcomes. So when the pandemic hit, it sort of, forced us to pull, not just look behind the curtain, we snatched the curtain down, right? And we saw that the communities that were disproportionately impacted were those communities 
where people resided, where they could not social distance. We saw that the persons who were disproportionately impacted were essential workers. Outside of the healthcare center system, those essential workers were people who keep our economy growing, right? Going and growing. They deliver our packages. They ensure that the water system stays um, operational. They ensure that our children have uh, education and access to childcare. They clean our homes. They do all of those things that we were taking for granted. And then when you connect their social determinants, you recognize that many of those persons lived in multi-generational homes. They could not social distance. We then found though, where the health system has continued to fail us. And when I say us, I'm not just talking about black and brown people. I'm talking about the nation as a whole because we are all in this together that when those persons presented for care, they did not receive the same level of engagement as others. They did not have access to the testing. They did not access, have access to some of the care delivery. That is where the health system has continued to fail the people, particularly black and brown people in this country. So when you put all that together, what you find is that African-Americans, Latinx persons, persons who are essential workers, all were disproportionately impacted and exposed. And that translated to hospitalizations and death. And the reason that it translated to more hospitalizations and death was another systemic challenge that we have seen. And that is the health disparities with the disproportionate number of black and brown people have chronic diseases because of the negligence that we've seen in the health system to their care. All right, that's a really uh, fabulous framing. And, and, and there are about four or five issues that I wanna uh, dig into, into those. But one of them, uh, reminds me of a statement years ago when I was a very junior faculty member and I was doing my first set of research around healthcare disparities in America. And I found myself uh, to have the privilege of being on a panel with one of my heroes, Dr. David Satcher, mm -hmm. you know well. And Dr. Satcher, former Surgeon General, uh, said, I was describing some of our work and he said, it's a line that stuck with me my entire career, he said, you know, in the, in the deep inequities we have in our society mm -hmm. that are longstanding, we had always hoped that health, the healthcare system mm -hmm. would be part of the solution. Right. But time and time again, we are reminded it's part of the problem. That's right. It's part and it just, it sent a chill <laughs> down my spine because there's so many complicated issues, but the healthcare system should be a force for bridging that gap. Not that we think that it could bridge all those gaps, but it should be narrowing that. But what you laid out was that in this pandemic, it has widened those gaps. Widened those gaps. Um, and, and that is, so I, I wanna start off talking about, um, and I, I will come back to that, but I, I, I wanna start off talking about a um, couple of things. One is why we have this confluence between people who are essential workers Mm -hmm. and black and brown communities. It is not random, right? That, that the people who cannot socially distance, who live in multi-generational households, mm -hmm. uh, who live in communities where there weren't testing sites set up. It is not random mm -hmm. that those are disproportionately black and brown communities, black and brown mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about the historical context yeah. of why these two factors come together in the way that they did during this pandemic? So I, I'm going to I'm going to read a phrase from um, one of uh, the, the the author of the book, The Political Determinants of Health, Daniel Dawes, who happens to lead our Satcher Health Leadership Institute, <clears throat> and he says it best. He says the U.S. has struggled to apply the doctrines of equal protection and general welfare to its laws and policies for more than 225 years. As a result, 
implicit biases are so baked into our political system that even in the most dire health emergencies, our actions tend to help or favor some groups over others. Consider how policy decisions have differentially affected those experiencing the opioid addiction, mental illness, HIV infection, for example. Now, we can go back though to the time when we were first as black people brought here in slave ships and the conditions under which people survived is amazing to me. I, I, I don't even know how that happened, right? And you, we won't, don't have time for a genetics course and I would probably fail it if I tried to discuss it very thoroughly, but there was epigenetics going on happening in that slave cargo. And the survivor of the fittest was occurring. And it has continued to be multi and intergenerational. Okay, so that's for another topic. But when we got here, we were not seen for our strength of survival for the right reasons. We were, we were seeing that we could be more of workers and persons working out in the fields, et cetera. And we're seen as less human. So when you go back and you read, um, I think her name is Harriet Washington's book, uh, Medical Apartheid. And I've had that book for years. And to tell you the truth, uh, Dr. Ja, I cannot read it consistently. I cannot, I have never read the entire book. Because when you start to realize what type of experimentation occurred, I'm an OBGYN, reproductive endocrinologist, and fertility specialist, right? So Mary, I grew up thinking that Marion Sims was a hero. But then when you understood how he actually perfected repair of vesicovaginal fistulas, or that he used for a tetanus, Techni uh, experimentation children, when you start to look at that, you begin to recognize the history and how the mistrust and distrust has continued. And then we hear the stories of what happened in Mississippi with appendectomies. We all know about the Tuskegee story. We all know uh, about some of the challenges that we're even hearing now about in re, uh, detention centers or centers in Georgia where women are still supposedly being um, subjected to hysterectories without consent. And so when you hear that information, you understand how the system continues to fail us. Now, what I try to speak to people about, particularly our community, is not to dismiss our history, but to acknowledge it and ask, how do we move beyond this? How do we move beyond? How do we build the components of trust that one must have in the health system? One of my reasons for choosing to come to a historically black medical school as the Dean and now the Dean and President was because I thought that I could lend a voice, advocacy, having trained most of my career at majority institutions. I thought that I could serve as a connection for a bi-directional connection to build trust that needed to be built between the establishments that sometimes control the decisions and the resources, but for them to really see the opportunity for building the trust with systems that really had direct connection to black and brown communities. Yeah, so so much to unpack there. Let me say maybe a couple of quick things and then I wanna, and I definitely wanna spend more time talking about trust because uh, it has both affected how things have happened so far, but let's be honest, it's gonna completely shape what happens over the next six, 12, 18 months. Uh, 
Right. Um, you know, just one personal reflection. So when I was talking about that uh, paper that I was just, I had published that where I had that panel with, with Dr. Satcher, um, it was the beginning of a series of work. And, and I'll, I'll share with you really um, my naivete on this topic, right? So I, uh, I, I started doing work when I was a brand new junior faculty, uh, looking at this idea of concentration of hospital care. So, so work with me for a second, because you'll see okay. <laughs> both where it's interesting and what, what I missed in terms of context. Yeah, I think yeah. all, speaking openly, right? We right, all right. learn. We all grow, we all grow. We right? all grow. So uh, one of the things that I found really remarkable when I started looking at data, um, this is about 20 years, 15, 20 years ago, was that um, care for black patients in America was not evenly distributed. That even in communities where there were a, a lot of black folks, that they tended to go to certain hospitals over others. And I thought this was really interesting. And I thought it had some important policy implications. And so I did a whole series of work on, on hospitals that disproportionately serve Black people and asking who they are and what their strengths are and their capabilities are. And, you know, a couple of years of writing papers and doing the analysis. And then I started, and this is, you know, the little light goes on in my head. And I started realizing, what's going on here? Why is this happening? And that's when I first began to delve into the history of segregation of hospital care in America. Again, these are not random coincidences, it's not just a matter of, oh, isn't it interesting? It is not just interesting, it's historical, it's got deep roots in our country. And so while we may have desegregated hospitals uh, in 1963, uh, the truth is, or 64, or somewhere around there, the truth is um, that there's still a lot of segregation and it's driven by historical issues, right? And, and, we, uh, and policy is important, but policy only goes so far on these mm -hmm, kinds of things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so policy that- Policy and I, will. It, you know, it's, 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 it's policy and the will of the people. And one of the things that we saw with George Floyd, we were all on pause, right? We're, we're all uh, supposedly quarantined. We are on pause everybody is glued to their television. You could not ignore what you saw. You could not say I was too busy, da, 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 because it was in your face. And I think that that is one of the things that we're gonna see as the impact of COVID-19, I hope, as we have pulled down this curtain and saw the systemic nature of the structural barriers that have been placed to prevent people from achieving health equity, that we have to tear down those barriers and they are in our face right now, yeah. they're in our face. They have made, this pandemic has made plain, what I'm hearing from you, has made plain what has always been just behind the curtain That's right. and obvious if you were willing to look. But now you don't have to be willing to look. You can't avoid it. You, can't, you cannot avoid it. When you turn on the television and you say to yourself, why are all these cars lined up for a box of food? What does that say about us as a country? Why are we being inundated with the inability of us to put together a system for testing? Why wouldn't we wanna know who's positive? Because it would mean that we would have to extend a resource that would require that we uh, uh, apply and allow for appropriate care delivery. And so we, we rather work in this chaotic state, which is what we are in right now. We're in a chaotic state, which is unnecessary. So I'm wondering if you could, we could go one step deeper on this. And, mm -hmm. I, I, and let's use testing as, a, as an example, um, because it's so, um, in some ways it's so glaring and so obvious. <clears throat> That when the when things were really starting to get bad in March, April, May, um, and as testing sites were being set up, uh, 
again, only later did we really discover or we, we proved, I guess, but what was happening was that the testing sites were not being set up in the communities that were being the hardest hit. They were in fact being set up in the suburbs where most people were working from home and the places where people were not working from home and living in multi-generational households. In those places, it was much harder to get testing. A lot of this was, were state decisions. These were not even like, it wasn't the federal government saying we'll set it up here and not there. What do you think drove that? I mean, what, because I'm sure if you sp speak to the people who made those decisions, consciously they'll say, well, I wasn't trying to be, I wasn't trying to, you know, uh, uh, set it up in a place that would disproportionately uh, impact certain groups. So how, why do we land there? What, <laughs> what goes on in the policy mind? What goes on in the policy world? Do you think that ends up creating those effects? Because we're talking about testing, but that keeps happening over and over and over again in lots of different areas, right? So this is not a one-off. So I can give you a Help great example that. of testing. So we're in, we shut down March 16th, like everybody else, right? Shut down the school, et cetera. I immediately know that testing is a strategy. Why? Maybe because I have somewhat of a public health background and I understand healthcare delivery. So I reach out to a genomics company that I'm very comfortable with, Color, and I yeah. get first in line with them. And so Color may be working with you, all right, yeah. We so know I Color, get, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I get first in, I know Achman very well. I get first in line, I say, Achman, look, I know you have high throughput testing. I know you're gonna turn your platform over to COVID. Put Morehouse School of Medicine in because I knew that we had to have testing in order to even think about opening up because that only made logical sense to me. Okay, so that's an access point, right? So first of all, you got to have access, right? The second thing, though, is that the Atlanta Metro Chamber came to me and a group of business leaders and said, look, we want to do a demonstration project. We know the governor, them are working on a plan, but what if we put together a demonstration project for them that would allow for 2 million Georgians to be tested? Dr. Ja, we worked for four weeks straight, all weekends, et cetera, putting together a comprehensive, what I call the resource aligned testing strategy. We reached out to the 400 independent pharmacists mm. in the state to get them to be sites for specimen collection and where they had the capacity, we were gonna put PCR testing there. Okay, or if we had the Abbott machine, we would have put the Abbott there. We did all of this. And then one weekend, the governor made a different decision. Political terminus of health. His focus shifted to the number of people that were being challenged in nursing homes. And that gave me a rude awakening about how insidious this problem is hmm. and how even though people can see the problem in front of them, they must have the will to change. And so what I am hoping with the Biden-Harris transition, that they understand that we must have a resource aligned testing strategy, meaning that, first of all, everybody ought to have access to testing. And it probably needs to be on a cadence of every seven to 10 days. And that you can set up these central locations where most of the tests can be run. But for some places, you can do uh, point of care testing, antigen testing, et cetera. Depends on whether you're in diagnostic or surveillance mode. That's what, call, that's what resource aligned means. And you and I know that this is not rocket science, OK? People go to the moon, we can do this. And so what we need for people to do is to stop worrying about the politics. And clearly we are not worrying about costs right now in this country for the way that we are spending money and wasting resources, that we can put together a strategy that allows every person in this country to receive, I usually have my little package here, a package they can get it in the mailbox three days a week. We could care less and they can swab themselves and drop it in a drop. I activate a kid and drop it in a drop box because one of the things we know is that everybody 
has a cell phone just about. And if they have a cell phone and they're willing to swab their nose, then we know we can get them tested. And so part of this, you all though, has been this soft bigotry of low expectations. Resources are often allocated based on expectations and not need. And so I hope that this COVID-19 transition team that is in place understands from a public health perspective that even when we get the vaccine fully vetted and we have 60% hopefully of the population that we're still gonna have to keep doing our public health measures for a period of time, right? The three W's, wash your hand, watch your distance, wear your mask. And we're gonna to have to continue to offer regular testing. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think, thank you for that. And, 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 and that story of that shift is really powerful. And, and, um, and I think the other message here of, of even with vaccines, it doesn't all come to an end and immediately no. life doesn't go back to quote unquote normal. Uh, we'll continue to have to engage in public health efforts. Yes. I wanna uh, shift to a question that has uh, come in okay. um, from, from Nicholas Jones. Uh, who's a PhD student, so uh, I think you know. <laughs> yes. uh, and uh, he asks a question that where I, is really where I wanted uh, to, uh, where I really wanted us to go. So his question, uh, and Karen, do you want us to, I see something about, would like to answer this question live. Is, is, are we going to get Nicholas to ask a question, or can I just ask it? You can just ask it, Dr. Jock. Okay. All right, sorry. I just want to make sure if uh, I'm not I'm not stepping on anybody's toes here. But but Nicholas, a great question is where I was going to go. But let me just read your question because it it raises a set of issues. He says, uh, "My name is Nicholas Jones. I'm a third year PhD student uh, here, and and with COVID vaccine deployment imminent, there are questions about equity of vaccine rollout. What are your thoughts on those processes, and how do you think private manufacturers should interact with federal and state governments? Thank you. And let me take that." central question and then let me add a little bit more to it, which is um, you've laid out the historical context and the current context for the, the issues of, of trust and mistrust uh, that are real and that are important. Mm -hmm. And vaccines are all about trust, mm -hmm. right? Because you're taking healthy people and you're injecting something into their arms and people have to trust the process that has landed that vaccine there. And, right. and so if you could talk both about equitable distribution, which is something I've been thinking a lot about and worried about, but also the issues of, of trust around vaccines and how we begin to address them. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Nicholas. It's nice to uh, know that you're out there. Uh, uh, Nicholas, I have known Nicholas for a long time. His, his mother and I went to medical school together and so uh, we, we thought we were gonna get him to go to medical school and somehow y'all convinced him to get a PhD, but um, maybe he'll go get a medical We're medical happy to help. After that, right? <laughs> um, so this is a really serious issue, this trust and mistrust that is in uh, our communities around clinical trial and clearly around the vaccine. So early on, blackdoctors.org, uh, the COVID-19 uh, co Coalition, um, uh, the National Medical Association, the National Association of Black Nurses, the National Urban League, we started having these town hall meetings. We've had five of them. We have one tonight, um, and I can definitely send the link to everybody. And we've had 30,000 people online every time. Wow. Had Dr. Gary Gibbons. We've had Dr. Peter Marks. We've had people who've received the vaccine. We've had people who are in the development of the vaccine, et cetera. And so we've just been answering questions to build trust. One of the things that all of the four historically black medical schools did was put on our website, this whole statement of trust about protecting the members, listening to our community, not acknowledging the distrust, but talking about how we move forward and upholding no matter what, do no harm. So that's all on our, on our websites. All four historical black medical schools are sites of the vaccine trial. 
uh, so that um, we can participate and show people that we believe in this type of work. And then we wanted to make sure that we were in the room though of decision. So I agreed to serve on uh, one of the NIH panels that it has been reviewing each of the protocols, looking at consent forms, looking at the data, the information that was developed culturally and linguistically asking, was it appropriate, right? So that we could make sure that anyone in any community will feel comfortable that first of all, that this was voluntary and they had choice and that it was safe and that it would not be released to the public until it was safe. Dr. James Hildreth, who is the president of uh, Mahara Medical College, who is a renowned virologist, he's on the FDA team who's going to be at the hearing tomorrow. And of course, okay. so he's reviewed all the data. So we've yeah. tried to make sure that we were in the room where it happened. We then, right before Thanksgiving, sent out a love letter to Black America. And I'll just read you the first line of it. It Please says, do. we love you. It says, dear Black America, we love you. We affirm that Black lives matter. And as a Black health professional, we have a higher calling to stand for racial justice and to fight for health equity. In the spirit of unconditional love for every single Black American, we have locked arms in an initiative to place the health and safety of our community at the heart of the national conversation about COVID-19. And it goes on. Oh my gosh. And we did that though, because we know what Thanksgiving means to our communities. We know that people wanted to lock arms and eat turkey, et cetera, but we were saying, hold up, wait a minute. This is serious. So now to answer the part of Nicholas' question, you know, Nick, I have um, been very, very cognizant of the number of doses that the um, Warp Speed team uh, in the uh, White House decided that they were going to purchase, right? And so, you know, on average, with except for AstraZeneca, they got about, a, they <clears throat> paid for or were assigned or agreed to purchase about 100 million doses of the others. But that's looking at about six other vaccines, right? And so if you were to, all of them were to come in at least 70% effective, you, we would end up with about 800 million doses, which of course, 300 million people in the United States, of course, we should be able to vaccinate everyone. However, right now, we only have 100 million doses uh, from Pfizer. And if you look at this as you need two doses, in order to have the full level of effectiveness, you really only have 50,000, right? 50 million, excuse me. And so therefore we are going to see a more even deliberate process of how we allocate. Now I listened to parts of the ACIP, um, the CDC hearings the other day, and believe me, they have been very thoughtful in their deliberations. And I know people on those advisory groups and have having sat on the FDA advisory committee for eight years for reproductive and health drugs. I was on the advisory committee when we approved plan B and you're talking about something that was political. When you get on 60 minutes and you don't tell your mother, okay, that's a problem. Okay. Because we plan B was very controversial. Those persons on that committee have been very thoughtful about this allocation. And if you think about the group, that we need to make sure that we keep functional. It's healthcare workers. And what I really loved about it, they broke it down and looked at those essential healthcare workers beyond just the doctors and the nurses and understood that they were equal, equally at risk and they have to be treated with equal allocation. I really like that. And we know that black and brown people are disproportionately in that group of essential non-provider healthcare workers. The second group they looked at was the long-term care um, facility um, persons. Persons who reside there, you all, only account for what, 1% of the population of that? They had about 6% of the hospitalizations, but then they had about 30 to 40% 
of the death of deaths. That is what we call a health disparity. Okay, so we can't talk in one sentence and not walk it also, right? So we then have to make sure that we protect those individuals. That's what our charge is as healthcare providers. That's what our charge is as public health specialists. And then the other part that's included in there is the personnel that work in those long-term care facilities. What will get to be challenging if we don't use our private public partnerships is how do we do the next levels? And I don't know how you feel about this, Dr. Ja, but knowing pretty much haven't seen you almost every night, I can think that you are pretty reasonable about this. We need to use CMS, insurers, academic health centers, where there's a lot of safety net hospitals to help us to identify those persons at greatest risk. The one thing about somebody who has a chronic disease, guess what, it's been diagnosed somewhere, right? So there's a code in somebody's system that can identify who has two chronic diseases versus one chronic disease. And we can then begin to understand how we should parlay or allocate these resources. The critical link though, is who's gonna be the trusted messenger. One of the most trusted messengers is the person's provider. They are the ones who have that relationship with the patient. So we ought to be looking at the primary care network. Mm -hmm. We ought to be looking at the physician provider network and ensuring that we are educating and giving them comfort because I would be more um, apt to come to my physician's office to get my vaccine. Now, the other group we have to be concerned about is the people who are not in the healthcare system, who are on the margins. And the federal government has to have the commitment to ensuring that we create the right grassroots partnerships. And the last thing I will say on this is that I was on a call with the National Town Hall with the National Academy the other day, and I reminded them that, and, and Francis Collins was there, and uh, Stephen Hahn and Redfield were on the call, and I reminded them. HHS gave out, an Office of Minority Health gave out one grant of $40 million called the COVID-19 Resiliency Network and Morehouse School of Medicine got that grant. We have been building a coalition now with 42 national organizations on the five vulnerable populations. We have developed culturally and linguistically appropriate materials, education materials, and we've been focused on testing and care delivery. We now need to extend that opportunity for vaccine because we need to reach out to those vulnerable populations and we need to utilize the network of the grassroots organizations to make that happen. Wow. So. A, lot of, a lot of work has already gone into this and it feels like you are poised to um, go that next step in terms of dealing with, with issues around vaccines. Um, I've got a couple more questions here and let me, let me ask the first one from one of our uh, faculty colleagues uh, who I think you know, Jazz Aluwalia. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he asks, uh, what role do you think HBCUs and Hispanic serving institutions can and should play in achieving health equity during this pandemic? So I think you've gotten us going on that answer by talking about some of the things that uh, Morehouse is doing, some of the things that uh, the, the uh, Black serving medical schools have historically black serving medical schools have uh, done, but help us think a bit more broadly about uh, these institutions. Um, they ultimately are a small portion of all the uh, academic institutions in America. Uh, they may be powerhouses, but they represent only a fraction of all the academic institutions. Uh, so, how what role do you think they can play? And I'm going to take the liberty of extending that question is how do institutions like ours, like Brown, uh, do a better job of partnering with historically black colleges and uh, to amplify and to make that impact bigger? So you're right, we, we touched on this. So participating in the vaccine trials, participating in research, I think we have four or five therapeutic trials that we're participating in with COVID-19 
Um, looking at, uh, we're looking at some of our compounds for the treatment of COVID-19. So we're very much involved in the research space. So a lot of times people wanna put us in a box for the community participation and community engagement, but we're very, our scientists are very much involved in the research. Now, the importance of that though, is that remember we have now persons who are our PhD students, our master's students, right? Who are now our health policy students who are being exposed to this at a grassroots level. So that is going to extend the academics uh, knowledge that hopefully if they don't stay here, they'll go to some other institution and continue to advance that. The other thing though, it, it does matter who we educate and train, you know? So we want to make sure and all of our students have clearly have, we've integrated COVID-19 in their curriculum, but not just from the science and disease perspective, but from the population health perspective. And we will use this over and over again. In the Atlanta University Center, which is the largest consortium of four historically black colleges here, 90 year old organization, we have just launched a data science initiative. So we mm -hmm. hired Dr. Talitha Washington, who is a PhD mathematician. We worked at Georgetown or George Washington for years. And we've hired her to lead our initiative. And every student in the Atlanta University Center will get to have a minor if they choose to in data science. But they are core courses that everyone would take regardless of their major, humanities, social science, whether they are finance, et cetera. There are core courses that we take in data science. And at the graduate level, we give masters and PhDs. We will use the data that we are developing, the data repository as modules for training. So I think that we can go a long way with ensuring that the competencies to address healthcare challenges and healthcare policies are being um, utilized in a way that we extend the learning of this. And so all of that jazz is about achieving health equity because if you create culturally competent providers, healthcare professionals, when that patient is sitting across from them and they ask that question of Vesu sitting in front of me, what's possible? They don't put that person in a box. They don't put that limitations on that person. They actually ask, what do I need to put in the box so that the person is tall enough to look over the fence to achieve their optimal level of health? And so we are really, I think, charged with uh, actually educating and training this diverse workforce. Now, when you talk about partnerships, some of the greatest partnerships that we've seen have been between some of the HBCU schools and majority institutions that tend to be more resource um, um, intense and research intensive. The challenge with some of the partnerships in all honesty though, Dr. Ja, has been not bi-directional. Mm -hmm. So the large institution has this concept that they're coming to save the HBCU. So we don't need to be saved. No, in fact, we need right. to save some of you all, okay? That's what needs to happen. We need to save some of you all. So it has to be a bi-directional level of engagement yeah. where we both are, are exchanging our students in the learning environment where we're both sharing our research ideas. I love and that. so it's not always about finances. It really is about human capital. So we yeah. would love to see further engagement with institutions like Brown, who we have a significant amount of respect for, for what you're doing in the public health space, what you're doing in the care delivery space. Because when you think about some of the populations that you are serving, rural populations, people who are coming from areas where they don't have as much access to care, we all have to use those um, opportunities to extend access and care for everyone to achieve health equity. Yeah, I love that. And, and we should talk more about that partnership, but I completely agree, uh, you know, the old sort of model of we're here to help you and like, no, no, we don't need help. That's not what we need is, is long-term relationships, right? right? We need, because both sides benefit enormously. I mean, Brown has had a partnership with Tougaloo College in Tougaloo, Mississippi since 1964. And 
I have to tell you, when, for me, one of the joys of this job, which I took over just three months ago, was walking in and realizing I've got 50 years of relationship that I can lean on, that I can learn from, and I can, it's not, you know, it's not a, a, a so anyway, I, I think those things are, are what really makes long-term differences, not short-term uh, transactional things. I, I will tell you just one quick thing, and then I want to get to the next question. Okay. Um, which is, I am thrilled to hear about the data science uh, initiative across the Atlanta University Consortium and, 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 and Center. And the reason, there, there are a lot of reasons, but one of them is data science is not value neutral. Right. Uh, we, and there is a lot of opportunity for getting things wrong uh, if we're not thinking about how we have treated data on race and ethnicity and what that has meant and uh, and how our implicit biases show up in the data. Yeah. And so one of my um, favorite studies, not favorite because it was uh, good, but it was, but it was just because it was so thoughtful, looked at um, predictive models for who would need care, who oh, would yeah. need for resources, and found that black patients were consistently ranked lower because, get this, because we have a long history of under-treating people, the model said, oh, you don't need to treat those people so except, right? It like, it builds in the bias and the model essentially reinforces. The, 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 the model just reinforces it, just reinforces it. It's unbelievable. It. Yeah. And of course, the moment I saw that paper, I was like, oh yeah, of course it would do that. Yeah. And so, but it, it says that you gotta be intentional about these things. That the right, right. data are, are not out of context. They're not out. And so I love the fact. Uh, and, 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 and Dr. John, we, what we gotta think about is how artificial intelligence is being used. So I saw this paper yesterday. You probably saw it too, the MIT paper. Oh yeah. So they are now trying to make this assertion that it's not as effective in Asian populations or the vaccines are in Asian and black populations. Okay, so all they pointed out to me was that we need a long-term study that follows, okay, Asian, African-American, all people to understand the effectiveness, right? And, and, you know, what they're proposing, okay, we're going to put a peptide onto the vaccine to boost it up. Well, which peptide should you put on there? So, you know, I just thought, okay, we need to be careful about the assertions that we are making yep. based on a little bit of data, because you can model a lot of things and yep. it can be totally wrong. Totally yeah, we should, I, I'm with you. We should have an off, offline conversation about that at my team. Because I know you got inundated like I did yesterday with all the media saying, I'm like, hold up, guys. I was like, let me, right. let me call my data scientist and ask him, maybe I'm missing something here. Um, right. I need to go back and take a course in genetics, clearly. I got to go back and do that. Um, I, there are a lot of questions, but one of them I want to just get to very quickly because I think it's so important. Uh, is from one of our uh, faculty, Brad Brockman, who says, um, how, can you comment on the level of priority for incarcerated individuals? Mm. Uh, because we've seen vac we've seen the disease uh, harm that, that those individuals, crowded conditions, unable to socially mm. distance, just high rates of infection, obviously over-representation over of black and brown people. Mm. How do we think about that? So full disclosure, I, I recently joined the board of WellPath. And WellPath is a healthcare company that provides care to incarcerated or persons who are assigned to state mental health facilities. Mm. And, and, and you know, my board and others asked me, why would you be interested in joining this board? And I said, because this is a disenfranchised population. It aligns with everything that I care about. These are mostly a lot of black and brown persons who are disenfranchised. There's no continuum of continuity of care when they're in there per se and when they get out. What if we did some things differently and understood that 60% of them are in there for nonviolent offenses are in there for substance abuse? What if we created substance abuse treatment programs while they're in there and then had a way for the government to extend that care for a 12 week period of time afterwards, you know, just some basic things. So I said, that's why I got on that board. So a voice of reason and perspective could that. be there. I am very concerned with the number of persons who are disproportionately impacted in those settings. 
and they've gotten better with the understanding of um, the wearing a mask and, and hygiene, but they cannot social distance. And as you see, no one has them on the list of the phases, unless I missed it, Dr. Ja, of vaccine allocation. I haven't seen it. Now, clearly we have to worry about coercion, choice, whether or not it's gonna be voluntary. But that is a population that is missing and we need to address that because in some states they have a much higher hospitalization and death rate. I know that WellPath has done a lot, but initially what they had to do was buy their own PPE. They had to get all of their own PPE to get to, their, to the healthcare providers and to the persons who were incarcerated. So it must be addressed. And I am hoping, I have sent in a question to the uh, board, uh, to um, CDC to ask them, where, does, where do they fall in the phase 1A, 1B, phase two? Because they're in a congregate environment, right? They're in a setting where they cannot socially distance. So how do we treat them in that risk category? Very good question. And it has Very not good. been addressed at all. At all. That's why I at pulled all. it up because I felt like we needed to talk about it. At all. Um, all right. I'm going to ask you a question from one of our students. Students always ask the best questions. They do. Uh, so this is from McKinsey Mitchell, who says, uh, I'm a student who was accepted to Brown's Medical School and has an interest in healthcare disparities. Uh, as a physician with lots of experience and knowledge on maternal uh, health mm -hmm. and maternal medicine, how do you anticipate COVID-19 exacerbating the maternal mortality gap between black and white women? Well, the biggest concern, first of all, thank you so much for your question. Uh, and so you've already been accepted to Brown, so you can just come to Morehouse for your residency. Uh, you because go. we have, uh, we just launched a center of excellence for the reduction of maternal mortality. Mm -hmm. And one of the areas, of course, that we are dealing with is trying to gather a, 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 a right repository for following these patients long-term. Because if you know of, of the volume changes that occur during pregnancy, we are seeing that women who have COVID-19 definitely are having some uh, challenges and we are concerned about the long-term chronic diseases that may ensue because of those challenges uh, and damage to their vasculature. So, what we are biggest thing that we are concerned about now and, and been trying to mitigate is people continuing to come for prenatal care, okay? Uh, because everyone was scared, we really ramped up our telemedicine and all of the tools and that, that we could use to assure women that it was safe for them to come in and be seen. And that there were critical points that we still needed to, you know, do their. Um, hemoglobin A1Cs and all the things, the glucose tolerance tests and all the things that we needed to do along the pregnancy continuum to make sure that their baby and they were safe. And so we are seeing uh, an improvement in that. And that's because ACOG has done a very good job, I think, with engaging uh, primary care doctors and OBGYN doctors and keeping us very, very, very informed about ways that we can stay engaged with our patients. And many practices have totally adopted telemedicine because it is true that there are periods of time during the pregnancy that, you know, if I, if I see you, I can probably diagnose somebody with preeclampsia because I've seen enough of it, but just by looking at it and then asking them to dip their urine, right? Okay, so I, you know, I don't need a fancy test for that, but for ultrasound and some other things, uh, we definitely need to see patients. So my biggest concern is women staying on course mm -hmm. and coming in for their prenatal visits. And then long-term, what we're going to do is make sure that we track every woman who was positive during her pregnancy and that to make sure that she doesn't have some long-term chronic diseases. Great. Really important um, systematic approach. I'm going to ask you, uh, I'm going to try to squeeze in a couple more quick questions here. We're almost out of time, but one of them is from a, one of our professors, Renee Shields, who asks a question that really asks you to take off your academic leader and your policy hat 
and just keep your doctor hat on for a second. Okay. Let's see if I can remember um, that hat. Okay. Oh, you got that hat. You, that, that <laughs> one's ingrained in you. I know it. Um, the question she asks is on an interpersonal level, I'm sitting in clinic talking to a patient, black patient, fully aware of the longstanding um, injustices that our healthcare system has perpetrated on, on black folks, has real concerns about trust and, and trust in the system. What can we as, as frontline mm -hmm. providers do at that moment or over time as individuals to try to address those real concerns, to try to build trust, mm -hmm. uh, to try to because uh, there are systemic things that we could do when we need to do. But, but on a personal level, what advice would you have for Professor Shield and for really all of us? All right. So thank you. Thank you for that question. I sort of alluded to it earlier. One day when I get a moment, I'm going to write a book and it's going to be entitled, Based on Who's Sitting in Front of Me, What's Possible? If you ask that question, with every interaction with the patient. And I learned this a long time ago. It forces you to put yourself second and the patient first. Mm. And then you think about what's possible. So I've written this prescription for a patient. I have an idea that this is expensive. Do I know what that person's financial circumstances are? I've advised this patient to go exercise three times a week to walk to go to the gym? Do I know whether or not this person lives in a safe neighborhood? This person has raised fears about their breast cancer. And do I know it, who in that person's family has had breast cancer? Or maybe they just lost their best friend. I see this person coming in with hair thinning and stress, et cetera. Do I know what's happening with that patient's child in school or on their job? You have to ask the questions and you have to give that patient your undivided attention. It is so hard when you're trying to get it in, in 15 minutes, but it starts with, as you walk in the room, how are you doing the day? And pausing and listening for what the real chief complaint is. Yeah. And I think that to me, that is what the art of medicine is. That is the privilege that we get as healthcare providers. We get to be engaged in the most intimate details of people's lives, whether we want to or not. But that's what comes with it. And we can never take that for granted. And that is how you build trust. Now, I think we're getting, to, getting back to that. People are beginning to make house calls again. People are beginning to figure out that I do need to call and check on this patient myself. Even if you give a patient your cell phone or, and you only text with them, that's a point of contact. Now you have to balance it because you deserve a life also. But with this privilege of being a provider comes this tax of caring. Hmm. It's a very powerful way to, to frame that. And, and let me ask you maybe just one quick last question. We're right about at 10. As we emerge from this pandemic, <clears throat> we pull the curtain down, can no longer hide behind um, this veil. Are you optimistic that we will begin to finally as a country, not finally, because we've been making some progress, but we have a long way to go. Uh, we're going to make real progress so that the next time we have a health crisis, we're in a different place. Are you, how are you feeling about the future going forward? I am optimistic, but that is part of my nature. I always see the glass half full, never half empty. I think that there's so much that we can do if we put our mind and our hearts to it. And so I would ask for people to lead with their hearts. And so I think that <clears throat> the president-elect has put in together a team that is competent and caring. And I think we must have both. When you think about his, his selection for HHS, 
It is someone who has fought the, about the Affordable Care Act. Now, a lot of people thought a lot of other people ought to be considered, but we got to understand that policy sustains the things that we care about. So we got to have great policy and we probably need somebody who can be at the forefront addressing that, but who that person puts around them to ensure the execution in a manner that has a equity lens. Mm. It must have an equity lens. So yes, I'm optimistic. I'm even more optimistic if people like you, Dr. Zhao, stay on the TV and continue to present in this calm manner and tell the truth. We must tell the truth. We cannot, you all, live in this fallacy that this virus was just going to go away and all that was never going to happen. Never going to happen. But we do have the will and we have the power and the skills to change this and to move us forward. I'm very positive about that. All right. Well, well, hard to finish on a more positive and better note than that. I want to say uh, thank you first for um, your time today. But thank you more importantly for being a great teacher and a great leader for all of us. Uh, it's been my privilege to spend the last hour with you. And I know I speak for everybody who was able to join. So uh, I appreciate it. And, and I hope it's the uh, first of many things that we might be able to do together over the long Please, so, I look thank forward you, Dr. to our continued partnership. Thank all you right. all very much. Well, Have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.